actually, we can begin. Um, and welcome everybody uh, to our live webinar today in which we're going to be asking a lot of difficult questions about what's going on in Israel and trying to understand really what's going on in a, in a very, very basic way and what is some analysis we can have. Before we start, some uh, introductory notes. Um, so first of all, this is a live webinar, which means that all the participants who are in can see us, but you cannot see each other. Uh, at the same time, we are really excited and eager to make this participatory. So I wanna encourage everyone that if you have a question, you should please submit it. So the way to submit a question would be to, um, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see uh, like a little box that says Q and A. So at any point in this conversation, you can submit a question there. You can also submit technical questions and we have a wonderful support who can address it. And towards the end of our discussion, we'll pause, look at the questions uh, and go ahead and, and address them. Uh, so, so please, at any point, uh, write some questions. Uh, so again, uh, hi, um, my name is Michal Bitan. I am coming to you from Tribeca, from New York. I'm a fellow in residence uh, at, at the Shalom Hartman Institute. I am also a sociologist uh, and um, you know, engaged in different types of community building uh, here, uh, here in New York. And it's my distinct pleasure uh, to be right now in conversation uh, with Tayla Friedman, uh, who is a, a community activist, a Hartman scholar, a, a politician, and who will be able to really give us an insider's understanding to what has been going on recently in Israel, what have been the new developments, uh, and what are some of the big questions that any of those of us who, who care about what's happening in Israel should be, should be asking. Uh, and of course, part of the reason that we're having this conversation is because um, we are, you know, the Jewish calendar uh, keeps moving on <laughs> uh, and we will be having next week um, Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzmaut uh, and all these different celebrations of, of Israel. Uh, and this is a good moment before we celebrate to also pause and try to, and try to understand uh, what is going on? What is going on over there? So, so Teila, before before I start sending over questions, can you just please uh, introduce yourself uh, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself uh, and 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 the insider understanding that you can offer us? Okay, I think it's fair to say that I'll do my best okay. to um, explain what's going on because it's really really hard, also from inside. Uh, to keep track and to understand. So who I am. Uh, I'm Jose Knight. I am a lawyer by profession. I, I'm working now for the Hartman Institute, both as a researcher uh, in the field of uh, Jewish peoplehood and, um, and, and also as an educator um, in, this, in the same field. Um, as you say, I'm a, an activist, I'm a political activist, and we're very involved in the Israeli society for many, many years. Uh, and uh, five kids, I think that's it uh, for introduction. Now, what's going on? Um, where should we start? I think it's fair to start from a year and a half ago when the first uh, elections uh, were announced. It was before time, uh, and um, ever since then, Israel is in kind of a political crisis and a freeze also. We don't have government. Uh, it's a year and a half that we have temporary government. Now, temporary governments are very, very limited in what they're able to do legally. Uh, and after the last election, the third one, when the, the, the outcome was kind of, how do you say, do you have even teko in Hebrew, in, uh, in Aramaic, actually, it's coming from the Gemara, from the Talmud. Um, um, almost nobody could, um, nobody, no side, neither Bibi or Gantz. They could put together a government or a coalition because according to the Israeli system, uh, you need to have 61 Knesset members supporting you. It's not like in your system. Um, the problem actually is that we, our system is built to have few parties 
um, the build together coalition. But what happened is that um, the, the dispute around Bibi personally became so deep that he divided the society actually to two, for him, against him. And instead of being few parties that are able to agree on some, some issues and disagree on other and build together a coalition, it become like two blocks. And those blocks, three times, were almost even. So, so Taylor, just to reiterate, so we've had a year and a half of no government, of a gridlock, in which basically Israel could be divided into the pro-BV, anti-BV block. And, and if I may say, you, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you were situated in the anti-BV block? Yeah, I was part of the Yeshati party that went together with Hossein and created blue and white and got together under the leadership of Gantz. Now, it's so um, unusual because you could find right-wingers in both sides, the pro and anti-Bibi, like Lieberman, he's, he's a right-wing uh, politician. Um, and yet he was in the anti-BB side. And, and in, the second, uh, in the second elections, it was also somehow around religious questions, religious, religion and state. But in the third time, it was really totally pro and anti. Now, we had the election and then the corona Breakthrough, breakthrough, um, came to our lives, and we, like everybody, everyone else, as the situation became very, very severe, health-wise uh, and economically, and to stay in this even situation when nobody can create a government, um, and uh, so the meaning was to go to the fourth election would, would create a disaster, a total disaster economically and also a, a, in the ability of government to function, to, to, to confront the corona crisis. Right. And right. then Benny Gantz decided that despite the fact that he promised and promised and promised not to go with Bibi. He will break his promise and create a unity government together with Netanyahu. So let and me just re Taylor, just to make what you said like even stronger. So we have here a man who ran on three elections on the platform of the alternative to Bibi and anti-Bibi, uh, who suddenly now partially because of the crisis brought on by Corona, shifts his alliances. Also, like there was a breakdown of Kahol Levan party, right? In terms of Yeshatid and Telem, uh, and, and suddenly create a new unity government with Netanyahu. Yeah. Now, what were the options? It's also a question because the people who are against the unity government said there was a real option to build a government with the Arabic party. Okay, um, not with them um, in the coalition, but they could support it from outside, vote for this government without uh, actively participate, without being ministers, but support it. And then we uh, uh, decide would have 61, even 62. It didn't happen. Why it didn't happen? For two reasons. Uh, first, because there were three people, one from the Labour Party, only Labour Democracies, and two from the Blue and White Party, that were very, very harshly against uh, uh, joining forces with the Arab uh, uh, parties. Um, and then there was there was real, there was not really, um, it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. Uh, and then Benny Gantz made his decision. Now, I must say that even um, 
Personally, I left the Ashatid because I thought Benny Gantz was right. And the position of the Ashatid was wrong. I thought the situation is so severe that there was no really other way than building a, a, a unity government. Uh, yeah, you saw my kids coming. My oh, one, we, my little one coming. we have that daily at this point, all of us. <laughs> um, and now, the, now we're going to have a government, God willing, there's still some obstacle for it, because in order to do it, um, in this atmosphere of lack of trust between the two heads, and there is no trust between them, um, we need to change very basic things in our system, like they're both going to be uh, called prime ministers, and gonna um, only one gonna function as a prime minister, but legally they both called it a prime minister. And if one is leaving, the other one is automatically becoming hmm. prime minister. Right. So and and the reason to do it is the only reason to do it is because there is no trust, and and that's that's very hard. So, Teila, before we get into the lack of trust, and before we also, I, I also just want to try to unpack a little bit what does this unity government even look like? Um, but also because it has like an emergency phase of dealing with Corona, and then it has another phase, and a lot of the things that it's put forth are also being called into question in the legal system. There's a lot of complications there. But I want to just pause on something you said earlier. So you, you seem to imply that there were some people who were previously in the anti Netanyahu camp, uh, maybe as yourself, who are supportive of this unity government because the corona crisis is so significant that it kind of uh, needs to be prioritized over having to oust Netanyahu from power versus other voices, perhaps like Yair Lapid or others who are saying, no, this is a bad deal. And this, is, this, this moment does not ask from us to switch our priorities. Am, am I expressing this right? Yes, and also I think um, when society is so deeply divided, is that, um, is that the right thing to do to win? I feel that when there is one question that become like the, the one and the only, and one half will win the other half, it's dangerous. Is dangerous, um, and we need to find way to somehow, um, I don't know, to make it to make the situation softer, not either or black and white. And so, way to do it, I think, for me, was creating this uni unity uh, government with um, the promise and the obligation of Netanyahu that after a year and a half he will leave the position. And they will switch. And I saw it as the only way to finish his term without it becoming a civil war. Right. For me, preventing a civil war in the Israeli society, that's a first priority. Because I felt that after those two years, it became really dangerous. The atmosphere in Israel. It wasn't like we have two um, political views. It was we're enemies of each other, and and look, I know, and now I'm gonna um, push back a little bit to you. I think it's it's not happening only in Israel. I think this very very dangerous political atmosphere of the uh, political dispute becoming the war, and people seeing one each other as almost enemies, or seeing the other side as a devil. So. I, I agree a hundred percent that you know we can really talk about the dangers of polarization and what does it mean to have a house divided against itself, especially in light of a global crisis like Corona. But I'm not so eager yet to move to diagnosis. I still think, Teila, that we need your help to understand 
what is going on. And I want to be frank here. I read Israeli newspapers daily from many different sides in Hebrew and in English. And, and I'm still trying to just get the details, right? What is this unity government? Which are the parties that are inside the unity government? Are the Haredi, the right parties, the left, the center? Who is out? Um, there's like the emergency phase, then the longer phase. There's all of the new changes to the basic law that are being proposed. Uh, and I, I know it's a very big ask because it keeps changing and new developments are rising up. But any clarity that you can give us to try to understand this unity government, just to understand what it is, I think will be super helpful. Okay. Okay. So the basic thing is that Likud and um, blue and white. Blue and white is the part um, that Benny Gantz uh, leads. And they keep the name, okay? It's, I mean, the, 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 um, the party was called blue and white, and after the split, uh, 17 member states with a name, and another 15, uh, they, they went back to be called the Ashatid. Okay, Ashatitel. Okay, so that's blue and white and the Likud. And the ultra orthodox parties, yes, they are in. Um, now, who else? From the left side, the Labour Party. Um, at least two, maybe three of them are joining the government. Again, they split. Okay, half are gonna uh, uh, be in the opposition with Yair Lapid and, and Telem, and uh, Telem, and half are joining. Okay, so that's a Labour Party. I said the ultra orthodox party. Now, what's gonna happen with Yamina? Yamina, this is the, uh, the religious Zionist party. Um, I, I'm doing like that because. Um, also, look, I'm 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 from this uh, you know from this community, and I'm not willing to say that they represent the community. Okay, but so Yamina is the uh, uh, is the most right wing uh, party in Israel today, uh, um, led by uh, Naftali Bennett, and I'm not sure, and they. Are not, they didn't announce yet, are they going to join the government or not? And there are the uh, uh, parties that are going to be for sure out. So maybe this government will have a position from two sides. Yamina from the right, Yesh Atid, part of the labor merits, and the Arabs from the left. So, Atila, what you're saying is we do have a unity government, but it's actually not yet fully decided, Yamina, for example, if it's in or not. And the consideration is that this might be a unity government that will have to be watch, you know, watching over its shoulders and dealing with both oppositions from the right and left. Yeah. I must say that for me, those are not bad news. I think that uh, to have oppositions from two sides, that's healthier than, than uh, what I described before of those, you know, two divided blocks. Well, that is if Yamina stays out, because if they come in, then the opposition will be only from the, so, you know, left, center, left. Sure. So, Taylor, let me ask you another follow-up question. Um, can you explain a little bit, like, what are these news about, like, an emergency phase for the unity government versus, like, afterwards? Yes. Um, usually when um, government... Uh, is built, they have the baselines, okay? What's the, you know, basic ideas and the basic plans they want to promote. Um, now, this time, they decided that in the first six months, they're going to deal only with the corona crisis and with one exception, of a um, Trump uh, deal. How do you call it in, in, in Israel? We call it the uh, Iskata Me'ah. I don't know how you call it. The, the deal English. of the century? Um, yeah, the the peace century. deal. Yeah. Well, really, really the deal that has to do with annexation, right? And the ability of, of the Israeli government to do so. 
Okay, so there is something around it. I'm not sure exactly what it is inside because also there is um, there is no agreement on that. But that's an issue that's going to be dealt in the first six months as well as everything around the crisis. After the first six months, so I'm going to decide on the basic lines uh, in religion and state, in economy, things like that. Now, everything here, everything that I'm saying is first time ever in Israel. So it's not like only, you know, from outside that it's hard to, to keep and to understand, to keep track and to understand what's going on and what's going on. It's also from Israel because nobody, it's, it's really first time. So we don't know. But I, we do know that 62% of the Israelis support a unity government and there is a feeling there is a mixed feeling okay um there is a feeling of relief i think of having a government any government just having a government uh, after a year and a half um on one hand on the other hand there is a bitter field uh, of um huge portion of, of, of the society that didn't want Netanyahu to, to continue to be the prime minister. And there's a big disappointment around it. And also from, the right, also from the right, there is disappointment because they, after four years, you know, the last government, the last functioning government that we had, was a right-wing government and they felt that they, you know, they are the clear majority and for sure, you know, most of the Israelis support their policy and they wanted to promote the Trump deal and to promote um, other policy, you know, other reforms, economic reforms and, and, and mainly around the legal system. Mainly as they wanted to, um, to, to limit uh, the ability of the Supreme Court uh, or, or limit the issues and that the Supreme Court can get involved in. Right, so I think, Teila, just to, to expand on that, some of the tension that we've been seeing um, in Israeli society and government is like what happens, can the Supreme Court, for example, be like an activist court uh, that tries to stop certain things from happening. Uh, and if, if we think of the Supreme Court in Israel as representing the left, and I'm saying this loosely, but for our conversation, yeah. right? So then you have elements in the right who say, we wanna try to, to, to limit their ability to do so. And even right now, in terms of the unity governments, a lot of the positions, um, a lot of the amendments to the basic law uh, in Israel have to do with the, with the legal structures. Um, and trying to grapple with that. But Teila, let me ask you a question because you, you've, you've expressed right now that there's uh, both relief and bitterness uh, in different segments of the population. And I wanted to know, you know, beyond the headlines, um, who do people see as like the people who are gaining the most out of this unity government and the people who are losing the most from this unity government, as far as we can know right now? Um. Gaining the most, um, the ultra-Orthodox parties, um, that despite of great anger and, cry and, and, and uh, criticism that they got uh, during the corona, uh, um, the corona crisis and also beforehand, uh, wouldn't be touched. I mean, they didn't lose any of their power. Um, so that's, you know, that's a great win for them. Uh, and also personally, um, you know what, that's not true. I wanted to say personally Netanyahu, but I think his supporter see that, that his agreement to, to leave the position after a year and a half as, um, you know, as, um, injustice almost but they Taylor, said, wouldn't you wouldn't you say that whatever provisions are put in place for him to be protected from corruption charges wouldn't that be like the sort of win that he was going for yes for sure that's why i wanted to say that he he won a lot 
because the other option was that this will be a law saying that a, a, a prime minister that being um, that that um, that is now you know going through a, a, a legal process even before being uh, um, even before decision cannot be a prime minister like a minister in Israel. It, when you are a minister, you cannot have um, 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 um This is not legal, but uh, the law is saying the prime minister to be under indictment. You mean? Uh, yeah, exactly, in that way. That was the one that I was looking for. Yes, thank you. So, um, um, but, but so, so what, yes, oh, Sorry, it's a correction, because my, you know, to be put on trial. Yeah, thank you. What's the difference? Uh, between, in, in, well, I actually don't know the Hebrew terminology so well, uh, but to be indicted versus to actually be at trial, is there a difference in the Israeli legal system? Okay, great. I don't think so. I think it's the same. Great. Anyhow, anyhow um, so that's, but you see everything here, there is no agreement on anything because people who support Netanyahu said, well, the law is that the prime minister can go on being prime minister even if he is indicted. So it's not like you are giving anything. This is a law. And people who are against him saying, okay, maybe that's a law. But when Olmert was in the same situation, Netanyahu, you know, went very, uh, um, actually, that he cannot go, you know, he can't continue being prime minister and he has to leave, to leave his position. So there is clearly hypocrisy here, hypocrisy. Um, so yes, but Netanyahu gained a lot, so ultra orthodox gained a lot. Um, I do hope and I do think that the legal, Israeli legal system is gaining a lot also. It's being much more protected, that uh, the effort to, to that the damage uh, um, when it happened, the damage we were afraid from, um, that the, uh, this fear, you know, is that, is that we will be able to protect it. And that's for me is extremely important because you said before that people see the legal system as if, you know, of the left. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the legal system is, you know, protecting minorities, uh, protecting human rights, protecting democracy, yeah. uh, pro protecting women, protecting, you know, like in every uh, democratic country and uh, um, protecting it uh, was for me high priority. And, and, and so I, th I think that's gonna, um, um, the reforms that people, that the, the, the Likud and Yamina people was trying to promote, they're not gonna take place. The form of changing how we choose judges, of changing um, um, the place of court um, versus the Knesset versus the government, all those uh, things I don't think gonna happen. And that's a big relief. Right. Uh, right, and not to not to shift out of like the optimism and the relief, but we just you just mentioned who are the who gained things from this, right? Whether it was ultra orthodox Netanyahu in terms of immunity, legal immunity, uh, now the legal system. But who are the big losers, um, you know, right now in terms of all of these shifts that have happened in the past, you know, couple of weeks or even days? I don't even know at this point. Uh... Look, whoever wanted uh, to promote change in the Israeli society, to any side, is losing. Because when you have this kind of government, in many ways it's a status quo government. It's, it's like stability. Okay, You don't make big changes. Because in order to make a change, you need 
to have a, a, a government that agree on you know this reform, this change, this. So, uh, for example, someone like me who who thinks that the situation uh, around religion, the relationship between religion and state in Israel should change dramatically. I don't think I will be able to, or people like myself, we will be able to to get so much in this government because each side has a veto. Okay, each side can can block uh, um, things that they don't like. So change like that wouldn't happen. So that's that's a flip side of what I'm saying about protecting the legal system. True, but it's also protecting the chief rabbinate from the other side. Right. Okay. It's like the status quo, in a sense, uh, has more power uh, of, of maintenance. Uh, and also, I would say some people are talking about, you know, like, uh, you know, Yeshati, the Arab parties, uh, merits, like, you know, all those uh, parties who had maybe a chance of going to them to, to, into government now losing the chance they had uh, of getting in. Yeah. Well, the question is, did they really have a chance? I don't think. Um, I do, I do think that um, there was a potential of of of, um, of a really, really, really positive uh, uh, progress uh, in in Arab Jewish relation in Israel. So to have the Arab parties um, supporting Gantz, former Ramatkal, former um, head of the of the army, the Arabs are supporting the. You know, it's 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 really hard to. It was hard to imagine it a year and a ago before a, a, a year and a, and a half ago. So, so there was a potential here. Um, I'm I still think that we we do going to see changes in relationship with positive changes in relationship between Jewish and Arabs in Israel. First, because we will have a, an Arab minister in, in the coming government. And also because I think the Corona crisis um, emphasized so much what we have in common and, and change and puts a focus on civil issues. Um, versus what we usually put the focus on on security and national issues. So I think I think things will change in Israel in these terms. That's and that's very positive. The more civil as the government is, the more focus and 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 weight we're going to put on issues like health, and, and economy, transportation. For, for, for you, it's obvious that this is what government is doing, but I think that most of the Israelis are voting according to only, only according to issues of security and national identity, okay? And territories, you know, peace process, things like that. Never ever people voted because of economy or because of, um, you know, civil issues. So, and, and the corona uh, is so civic. <laughs> um, so in a way, there is a potential here uh, to, to a change. All right. So Taylor, I keep hearing from you how you're, you're, you're trying to show us the, the glimmers of hope or potential for, for perhaps what could be, even while we know that we don't know if, if those things uh, are going to happen, but we have to, uh, to work hard for them. But, you know, let me ask you one more question before we shift to take some Q&As from, from our audience. You know, until now, we spoke pretty much at the political realm, trying to understand what's going on, and really thank you for helping us uh, get a better sense of that. But I wonder in the realm of, of ideas and, and of values, um, you know, which we at Hartman really try to both engage with what's going on, but also ask the, you know, additional questions. Um, so what have you, I guess, as someone who's within the system, um, what have you learned uh, about the potential for, for ethical leadership? Um, what, what does ethical leadership, courageous leadership look like right now? For, uh, you know, both in which learning both from things that have been done in the right way and things that have been done in the wrong way. What are some of the teachings that you are taking with you? Yeah. 
you know, even talking about uh, ethics together with, with, um, with politics, it's so not obvious. We become, we, all of us, we become so cynical um, that, that it's, it, it really, when you speak about those two together, um, right away people treat you as, a, you know, very naive, um, what are you doing there, things like that. Um, so that's one thing, you know, the effort, we have to bring it back. We have to, to bring it back. Um, I see, you know, people who support Netanyahu, some of them, I think that's, that's a hard thing for me. It's one thing to support him because you think that in spite of the bad things he did or in spite of the corruption, in spite of whatever he, you know, and he's a, he, he did also very good things. Okay, fine. It's another thing to support him because he's, forgive me for the language, our son of a bitch. It's like, you know, he, he's, he's, he's horrible, but I want this kind of leader because when it comes to international politics, when it comes to security, yes, I want this kind of person to be, to protect, because it, 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 it's more protective for me. And I feel that for some of the people, um, this is a reason they support him. Everything that makes him, me feel uncomfortable with him being my prime minister makes them support him because they think that at the end of the day, it's serve, it is serving us as a country. Because politics and, and ethics are two total different things. Uh, so, so that's one thing I'm thinking of, struggling with. The other, and that's another side, look, almost everyone broke the promises. Um, but it's a question, should you as a leader do what, um, what you promised to do, or are you obligated to do what you think is good for the people? And, and to vote for someone maybe is to, to give him, to trust him, that to trust the way he think of what's good for the people. And it's a good question. I don't know what to answer. I mean, keeping promises, that's, that's the basic, basic thing of being honest on one hand. But what, when the situation is changing so dramatically, um, I felt that Gantz was obligated to break his promise. But do I, is that, you know, 100%, do I feel 100% comfortable with it? No. Nope. So, Teila, th thank you so much. And I do want to just, you know, uh, reflect on your reflections. Uh, you're really bringing up important questions about the place of ethics and values uh, and politics and strategy and trust and promises and the common good. Um, and and what, is, what is significant is that these are questions that I think in America over here, we're also thinking about in very strong terms, dealing with our own issues and our own government. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to have this conversation, you know, over Zoom uh, from different contexts uh, and try to really understand what, what, what questions we're, we're asking and, and, and grappling with. So we, we actually have a, a lot of questions um, from the audience and I'm going to shift to them. Um, and, you know, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, I do want to say, by the way, just because before we start the question, just a quick plug-in. Uh, at Hartman, we're doing a lot of this really uh, exciting learning opportunities. Uh, and my colleague just posted on the chat, if you can look there, just a link for anybody who wants to look at uh, Hartman at Home, which will tell you uh, daily updates of what's going on. And uh, one of my colleagues, Rivka uh, Press-Schwartz, who's fabulous, is giving a lecture tonight at 7 p.m. So just if you want more info about that and anything else, please go over there. And uh, it's a really fabulous way to be connected and to learn together. So I gave you, Taylor, a little bit of, of time to uh, get ready for more difficult questions that are going to come um, your way right now. So there's a question here that comes from Rabbi Rachel Sabat Bedalachmi. 
uh, which I think is particularly important for us also in the Hartman context. And she asks, um, what kind of relationship can this government have with the Jewish diaspora? And there's a part of this question is, what does the, their alliance with Trump uh, at all mean for Jewish leaders who largely disagree with, with Trump? So, so just to, to add to the question, um, when we think, we right now spoke about questions with religion and state, with minorities, but one thing we're always asking ourselves is how can we preserve Jewish peoplehood ties with American Jews who overwhelmingly identify as liberal um, with a government in which Netanyahu continues to be at its head, which is talking about annexation right now, very close to the Trump administration. Um, so what can you tell us about the, the relationship that this unity government Allows, allows for and or doesn't allow for? Actually, um, I think in, in this field, we have good news. Uh, one thing I didn't say before is that what makes it unite government is that the, um, each side, the Likud, ultra-orthodox, the right wings, and the left wing, is a relatively left wing, uh, have the same number of ministers, uh, is the same number of positions, okay? So the, um, the influence is even, even if the numbers are not even, okay? So, um, and why it's so important? Because in the last government, everyone were the same. They were all poor orthodox, um, very right-wing. Now, half of the government, much more liberal, much more open, uh, the issue of diaspora jury is a high priority. Um, the minister for diaspora affairs is gonna be from blue and white. I don't know um, yet who, but, uh, so I think, yes, we will see change uh, in, in the attitude. Also, look, we don't know what's gonna happen in your side of the ocean in, uh, in November. Nobody knows if Trump gonna to continue to be the president and that can be, you know, a whole new story. So we don't know yet uh, and it will have a great influence. So, I mean, look, I don't think we can, we will be able to, what we wanted to do is to, you know, bring back the cocktail agreement and, and have civil marriage, things like that. But I, I do think that we will see much more effort to somehow bring together or overcome the rift between the Asper jury and mainly American jury in Israel. And so that's good. So glass half full sort of thing again. Yeah. Great. So let me ask you another uh, question. And, and, and when I tried, there were about three or four questions about the same topic. So I'm just going to try to combine them all. So there's a lot of questions about annexation. Uh, and I'm seeing some questions about the process of annexation. Like, is that something that does Gans have a veto on annexation? Uh, can, you know, can they stop it? There's also some questions about is annexation something that the majority of Israelis are supporting versus not supporting? Um, so, so, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, I think, uh, around this question of annexation as something that is on the table right now. Uh, can you reflect a little bit uh, on this? Yes, though, I must say that it's a big question also in Israel. Um, first, what exactly is annexation? Because it's one thing to say that the Israeli law, that the settlements would be under the Israeli law. Okay, they are not today. Today, um, the legal, um, the legal um, authorization in, in, of the settlements is the army because it, the territories are not part of Israel. So if the only meaning of an annexation is that the people who live in the settlements are gonna be you know, totally under the Israeli law, that's not such a big deal at all. If the meaning is, um, the big question actually is what's gonna happen with the Palestinians. 
as a Palestinian that live in, the, in those places, like very close by to the settlements, um, will have the same rights or not? That's a big question. That's, that's a moral question. That's a, th this is a question. I don't know the answer. I don't know the, it, it, like the details of this, you know, deal big, uh, was a century deal weren't clear at all. Um, now, would guns have a veto on it? I think that, I think the agreement is that there will be free vote. Like each Knesset member would vote according to his, um, to his view and not, there will be no decision of the entire coalition. Um, look, that some people, it will be interesting question. What would Bugi Elon do, for example? He's a right winger, much more than guns. So, and he's a position. So, how to, I don't know. I really, really don't know. Uh, we also are not sure it's going to be on the table. Uh, very much depends on what's happening here uh, in America. Um, the, the feeling in Israel is that the, this deal is not going to be promoted so, so much. Um, so in Israel, there is less... The focus is not there, actually, in Israel. It's not on annexation. The feeling is that uh, if anything would happen, it would be very small. So just, I just want to make sure that we understand what you're saying. I think you're sharing a lot of things. One is that it's not perhaps the topic of the angst uh, in Israeli public in the way that maybe American Jews might be uh, thinking about. Uh, and also that it's very, very unclear, both in terms of if it happens, what does it look like in terms of the rights and status of Palestinians in the territories? Um, will it happen depending on what's happening uh, in America with the Trump administration and in the November elections? Uh, and also the process, it's not necessarily going to be party by party. It's going to be maybe more divided in terms of different MKs and, and their ability to vote. Exactly. Exactly. Um... Also, the European uh, are going to get more involved, I think. And you should also bear in your mind that some of the Israeli rights are against this deal because they see the 70% of the land that's going to be a Palestinian um, um, state. Um, now, what would happen with this part of the agreement? Some of the right wingers that were against the United government said, "If Gantz is coming in, we will see. Uh, maybe there will be some annexation, but what we will see very soon a, a Palestinian state. Uh, while if it was only Netanyahu, they were pretty sure that he is gonna dismiss it somehow." Okay. Very hard to tell, very, very hard to tell, but um, I, I must say that the Israeli public is uh, now much more concerned with uh, economic questions, uh, more than anything else. People are afraid for, for the very basic um, um, I, I mean, we have million people who lost their jobs. Uh, and we have people, you know, I don't know how many, what's the, I think more than 50% of the businesses uh, were closed. So it, 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 it's really severe. The depression, the economical depression is really, really severe and going to take a long while. So people are there actually more than anything else. Yeah. Tila, let me ask you one, uh, one last question that we have from, from the audience. Uh, someone anonymously asked, 
Um, what would happen if Netanyahu decides not to leave after a year and a half, a new election? And the reason I'm asking this question is because I think it brings another question to mind, which is, do, do we feel like things have finally settled or are people still afraid? Is this an illusion and is this going to be like the house of cards that kind of falls apart again and is destabilized? Have we, have we kind of gotten to a new, a new reality? Not yet. Um, because there's a question, is the court going to intervene? Um, and we will know it in, in few days, but we don't know yet. So we don't know if it's really, um, if it's illusion or uh, true. Uh, legally, what they decided, the agreement, like, is that if he's not leaving his, uh, his position, if he decide not to respect the, the contract, it's automatically the can't be coming. Like, there is no option. He can't. Um, and also he cannot uh, take the country to another election. He needs special majority for that, I think. I don't remember, but something like that. So, but again, we don't know yet. We just don't know yet if the, if the court is going to intervene and if they will intervene, what, you know, if they decide that um, someone who's under a trail cannot be prime minister, it's a whole new game. So, so Teila, it sounds like there's a lot of things that are up in the air. Uh, so I'm just going to name them again. Some of them have to do with the, the coalition, like is Yamina going to be part of the unity government? Some has to do with the legality. Is this going to be upheld in court, this unity government, and be able to have fit to stand off on? Uh, and if it does exist, then a lot of questions about what's happening in America, how is it going to influence things there, how is the government going to deal with the corona crisis, um, and, you know, and also broader questions around restoring public faith and trust um, in government uh, and what it's supposed to um, to do so, you know, we, we are we're going to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. But but Taylor, maybe um, maybe I can ask you. You know, it's going to be your Matz mode next week, um, and it's a celebration of you know Israel's existence and its accomplishments. Uh, it's a moment when many of us who love asking a lot of questions stop also a little bit and uh, and celebrate. Uh, and I'm just wondering, like throughout the conversation, you uh, I sense you working hard to give us the optimistic. Uh, view towards the possibilities and potentialities in what's going on. Um, what's your What's your Yomatz Maut message uh, this year that you are taking with you and that you would like to to share with us um, that we can keep in mind next week? Um, two, I think, two different. One is that Israeli society again prove itself as being extremely um, solidaric. Um, you, I can't even describe uh, how many different initiatives of, you know, communities supporting each other, helping each other, um, um, clapping to the doctors, um, uh, singing Manishtana uh, in the balconies. It, like, the feeling is uh, that in the social level, um, again, after three uh, elections that were painful. Um, there is an effort to hold together, and that's that's very you know that's moving, and that's something that I'm gonna take with me to your Ma'ut. Uh, we're, we're like we are much better than our politics. Uh, uh, every time that I'm talking to Americans, I tell them, look, we are not our government, just like you are not your government. So, you know, we need to, we need to remember it. Uh, politics is, is supposed to be a mirror of the society. I think that today this mirror is broken uh, in many Western countries. And uh, politicians, pol the, the political arena is not really ref a reflection of what people think and want. And so we have we have big job of, of fixing it, and I'm not sure how exactly. Uh, but but it's not the Israeli society is much better uh, than than the Israeli politics. 
also, I think, um, the fact that we have less than 200 people who passed away uh, in a very complicated uh, uh, situation is because we have a strong functioning um, state, uh, because our health system is central and public and everyone has access to it because when the ultra-orthodox were not, um, were, were slow, too slow to, you know, to, to close, to do, to do what they need to do, the army went in and the army took over in a positive way. Um, because, because I can give many reasons, but, you know, Yom Atzmaut is a day that we, we celebrate the existence of a Jewish state and it proved to be something that saved his life. So yeah, there is something to celebrate. And when you compare ultra-Orthodox in Israel and, and all around the Jewish world, you could see that in Israel is, is a suffer less, big time less. So, and that's because um, what the state did. Um, so some things that many times we see as, um, you know, Israel being too central and not, not enough multicultural, things like that, this time it played for us. Um, it played as something that enabled us to save life. Um, and a message of hope. Look, I live in Jerusalem. Um, I live in a place that we don't count less than, less than 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years. I mean, time is different here. Uh, the city of Yerushalayim, uh, Netzach, yes, the city of, uh, I don't know how you say Netzach in English, but forever. Yeah. So it's a long journey. It's a long journey to have Israel uh, in a way that we dream it. Uh, but, um, but okay, fine. We have, we, so, so it's a long journey. It's a mission. Israel is still a project. We're 70 years old. Um, I was under horrible fear of, of civil war, seriously. Uh, I always thought of, of the United States that when you were 80, you had civil war. And I felt that we are, um, we're in the direction of getting there. Uh, so for me, preventing it is a high priority. And, and I hope that, I hope that we move forward in, in getting some kind of internal peace or at least better net, betterness. Um, yeah, I am optimistic. I, 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 it's, not, it's not so much that I'm optimistic, I'm a believer. And, um, you know, that's, that's for me to be, to be Jewish, it's to be obligated to work for the good and to know that Afal Pishi it ma'amea im kolze. Right, so thank you, Tila, with those words that even, you know, when the messianic future progress comes slowly, we still have to wait and believe and fight for it. Thank you, Teila, so much uh, for all of your insights and knowledge and really helping us understand this moment. And thank you, everybody who's joined us. Um, we look forward to continue learning together. Take care.